Andrew Heaton. Hello. The person in my life that is the most outwardly panicked about how his personal political leanings will affect uh-huh. his friendships and possible relationships. Yeah. You're moving. <laughs> I'm I'm moving to Washington, D.C. I believe this is the official announcement. Yeah. Because I keep forgetting to mention it on my show. <laughs> yeah. When are you moving? Tomorrow. <laughs> Wait, no. Wait, yes, yes. Wait, today we're no, recording today, this on Wednesday. as people are listening to this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so. Um, you might already be gone. <laughs> I might already be gone. My car, my car that I'm planning to do a cross country road trip in while tr- uh, towing something does have some problems with it. So this mm-hmm. this might get pushed back till Friday. But yes, I am going to be packed up and moving tomorrow, moving mm-hmm. to our nation's capital of Washington, D.C. I will be doing that because I'll be working part time with Reason, making funny videos while continuing to do this program and the political orphanage. And so, uh, yeah, my my time in Austin is rapidly drawing to a close. Yeah, you're going to be a, a floating head on We're Not Wrong again. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I'll also, I'm literally flying back for the election. So you will, you <laughs> yeah. will see me in a fortnight. <laughs> I think we're still going to see you a lot. Yes. I kind of have that vibe. I think so. I think so. You're, I mean, you're going to see me every Wednesday till Bella goes to college. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah, no, I think it'll be, uh, it'll be good. Are you excited? I am. I'm, uh, I have, I have mixed feelings. I'm, I'm genuinely sad to be leaving Austin, Texas. This is a wonderful town. I've got a very good life here. Uh, but uh, as Especially considering the weather got nice today. It got, it, it got really <laughs> nice today. However, however, I do want to point out it's been 100 degrees twice in the last seven days yeah. in October, which is in defiance of the deal God made with us in Leviticus. He said in Leviticus, <laughs> you will always be able to wear a sweater in autumn. And uh, uh, and Texas has been flouting that. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited about the future, but I'm I'm sad to be leaving Austin. So I've got I've got mixed thoughts on it, but I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be a good time. And you last week we asked you whether or not you knew where you were living. You had right. not. You did not no, have an answer. I didn't. To that. You I, now have an answer to where you're going to be driving. I have an agreement and with staying. I have an agreement with a lady. So okay, here here's what I've done. On the way out there, I'm going to be staying at a series of farms. The last when, when we next record, I will be at an alpaca farm in Virginia, and uh, I will go from there because I'm I've got the camper. So I can, I can, you know, uh, uh, camp places. And then uh, when I get to Virginia, uh, I'll be can staying. Can I pause for one second? Has your dog ever met an alpaca? No, 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 no. I don't know. I know that he hates goats. <laughs> <laughs> so this well, could great. go either way. He <laughs> could go either <laughs> way. Alpaca. We, we, we were yeah. in Colorado one time and he saw a goat and he flipped out. And I don't know if he was scared of it. I think he, in his mind, it was a, a, a torturously large squirrel or something. And um, he likes to chase off cows like he's like a good guard dog for cows if they were a threat to the yard. And so I don't know how that'll go with alpacas. But well, I to be fair to Wallace, goats with their eyes facing in different directions. Yeah. And sometimes one's one color and the other is a different color. Like they're freaky little they're, things. They are freaky. Yeah, yeah. So there's yeah. a reason they're the stand in for the devil. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. They really are. Yeah. yeah it's they're very, freaky. It's very, like, it's very satanic animal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where alpacas just look like. Gen Z middle school boys. Yeah. They, do. they have the broccoli haircut. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, when I, when I go to I've got a Blankenship, the independent candidate who famously did the cocaine Mitch uh, uh, advertisement one time, the, his assistant, somebody who claimed to be his former personal assistant said that he would get uh, blanked out on sleeping pills and sometimes just send her random like emails, never inappropriate or anything, but just like, hey, remember to do this. But sometimes it'd be a little loopy because he was on whatever sleeping pill he was on. And one time it was just alpacas. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that email. There there was a, a eccentric, wealthy guy that I wasn't really friends with, but I would get invited to his parties when I lived in Manhattan and he would get trashed and then send me an email with one or two words from something I said earlier. So like 3 a.m., he would say like Mouseketeers because I'd made some joke with Mouseketeers. And I could yeah. never figure out, was this a threat? Was this just drunk? What was it? I think that- The original that, Heatonisms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I no, I think, it. yeah, that's like he's laughing about it. He just wants to let you know, like, yeah. oh, I'm still thinking about Mouseketeers. Yeah. yeah. So or, I interrupted or, or, you. Or it's, or it's him saying you up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been it. That might have been it. But yes, you start, you start at Alpaca Farms 
What's after that? Well, I'm, I'm staying at, I think of a vineyard on the, or no, I'm staying at an orchard um, on Sunday night. And then Tuesday night, I'm just in some guy's yard, like just some nice guy's yard. That's part of the service that I joined. And then, uh, and then, and then like the, what kind of, the it's legionnaires, called, it's called <laughs> harvest hosts and you pay an annual this. fee. And then you're connected to this network of vineyards, orchards, farms, and boondockers. That is to say places that are just, you can park here. And uh, so I'm trying it out because I think it'll be an interesting thing. Usually I stay in national forests uh, and I love doing that. But the one down, like the national forest camping thing isn't great if you're on a timetable because you get out there and it's dark and you don't know where you're supposed to park or if there's going to be slots and things like that. So I figured I'd do this on the way out. So. I've heard great things about it. Me too. I've heard good things about it. Yeah. 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 It sounds like a high end hobo trail. <laughs> That's I think literally what it, <laughs> it is. Yeah. I'm just going to be parking in people's yard that like with the alpaca. You have to learn like a secret code. You draw on chalk on the front, I, port, I think, uh, well, the front uh, fence. I've, I've already got permission from the people that I'm staying with on the way out. So they know I'm coming, but I think the, like the wink handshake deal is you're staying here for free, but you're going to buy some of our homemade soap or whatever the thing that is. That right? is kind of the deal. And I'm like, so I'm, yeah. I'm budgeting in like $20, $25 to buy a gift. But then I will show up to Washington, D.C. Late with gifts. With alpaca wool. Mm -hmm. and or an alpaca. Or an alpaca. Just bring in an alpaca to the office. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Because be be cool. you are looking for a place with a yard. Uh, yes. that It's weird. when I So I've lived in D.C. twice uh, in my 20s. And at the time, I viewed living in the suburbs as a kind of social death. Just this horrible, alienated a uh, uh, endless sprawl of of houses and nothing else. And now that I don't get drunk nearly so much, mm. and I, it's not important to me to be stumbling distance from a bar on a Wednesday, and I've got a dog and a camper, I'm real. I'm looking to move to Virginia. Like I, I don't really want to live in the city proper. It sounds like kind of a hubbub to me. And I like so anyway. Yeah, Arlington's the plan. And I need to find a place with a yard. We're we're somewhere near ish too. Well, good luck. When do you think you actually show up there? After your hobo tour, like you're leaving on a Thursday, what's your ETA? I'm, I'm, well, I'm going to go to Edmond, see my, my parents. Um, I'm going to leave from Oklahoma on Sunday. Uh, I'm, I'm planning to be rooted at the alpaca farm Tuesday night in preparation for talking to you on Wednesday so that we're not worried about me finding a good place to broadcast and all that. And then I'll get into um, uh, the D.C. area Thursday night. Okay, about a week. Yeah. yeah. Right on. What an odyssey. Mm -hmm. I hope our next episode is crashed by an alpaca. That'd be great. It would Nothing be really would funny if there were happier. alpacas bleeding in the background. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be that would be exciting. amazing. That'd be really good. We have uh, gifts. Sweet. Nice. In fact, uh, I forgot one of them downstairs. So I will, I will read these here. Uh, uh, never purchased stocks before, but the byproduct of being an econ major versus a finance <sighs> major, well, outside <laughs> whatever magic 401k does, but now I'm the proud owner of one single yes! Southwest Airlines stock. I'll do anything for the bit. Just bought 25 shares of love. Woo. Jury's PayPal. I've gifted three shares of Southwest stock for Bella Young. Why three? So she can begin her influence on the market early and watch the where not wrong voting interest in case she decides to go in a different direction. Jen now has an adorable incentive to fight for Southwest to grow uh, to the moon before baby B is ready to cash out. No pressure, of course. You guys have gained another Southwest <laughs> shareholder. Y'all should do an episode about this stock. What do you think the first parts of these episodes are? To the moon, Jen writes another email. By the way, these are all separate emailers. These are not this all is one amazing. emailer. There this are is, so many and more I did not, And I did not include all of them. This for is the record. so fucking funny. What are, my what are my favorite forms of humor? There's like, in, in, in Heaton's mental file folder of comedy writing, one of the folders is people getting really excited about stupid shit yeah. and appreciating it. And this is knocking it out of the goddamn park. I Speaking of that, during your last episode, I checked my IRA and I had enough cash to buy a share of Southwest Airlines. I figured I needed to get in before the price skyrockets due yep. to your influence. Plus it's a dividend stock, which I like. Uh, I'm in, see you at the next shareholder meeting. <laughs> I just bought a share of Southwest, so now I'm part of the love squad just to watch the stock uh, tumble from our repeated wishes to the monkey's paw, hoping that we can get Jen to buy. Uh, against my better judgment and my financial best interest, I am now a proud owner of five shares wow. of Southwest Airlines. I'll gift a share to Jen uh, when it goes to the moon. Love y'all. And then this 
is an actual uh, piece of news. Activist investor Elliott Management has been unhappy with Southwest financial performance and believes that its board of directors is entrenched and ineffective. They've recently gained an 11% stake in the company, granting them the ability to call a special shareholder meeting and nominate a competing slate of directors. You can find their plan at strongersouthwest.com. If Elliott does go through with this, they will likely hold the special meeting toward the end of the year or very beginning of next year. In the investment community, this is the closest thing that we get to a cage match. Southwest or Elliott are both going to try hard to court Heaton's vote and get their directors elected. Who knows? Southwest or Elliott might even be willing to speak to the political orphanage to plead their cases. Well, I would say this shareholder boom uh-huh. is not happening on the orphanage. It is happening on We're Not Wrong. And so I will say to both Elliott Management and to Southwest, the one place that you need to come for the influencer vote for whatever your <laughs> aims are, right here, baby. We're not wrong pod at gmail.com. Please, Jen, uh, give us your feelings. I'll be right back. To be completely honest with you guys, I don't get this joke. I don't understand what's <laughs> going on here. I don't know how to react to this. I don't know if I should buy the stock or if I shouldn't buy the stock. I'm completely paralyzed by this entire I, thing. It, it, I in, don't get it. In complete sincerity, I think you shouldn't buy this. I think you should put up a fight to, to make the joke <laughs> continue because what's happening is everybody's getting really excited that we're just doing a silly thing and going, yay, we did it. And like, like we're going to make letter jackets and things. So eventually you should come on, but you should come on right about when we think the energy is going to be completely lost in this joke. That's when you come on as the, the cap to it. But otherwise it's, it's more fun for you to be angry, to be honest with you. Like I'm, I'm thinking about going to the Southwest meeting to vote for whatever you don't want. <laughs> oh my God. You can't and do it. The joke will be much funnier if you can't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah, I know so that please I'm the remain butt of the joke, but please remain paralyzed about how to buy a share of stock. I've never bought an individual stock. I don't want to buy any individual stocks. I don't get why people want me to buy individual well, stocks. That's I'm, probably why somebody, a very nice person, oh no. sent this physical certificate wow. for one share of Southwest stock. Stop it. I will sell it to you for a thousand (laughs) dollars. So either you can learn how to use Robin Hood or you can buy this from me for a thousand dollars. I just don't know why anybody cares. Wait, so is is that is does the show itself now own one stock? Yeah. Who owns this? I believe this was for you, but I'm holding it. Okay, that's possession is nine tenths of the dealing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so we can next we can do an episode on corporate malfeasance and uh, uh, getting arrested by the FEC. I feel like I feel like the yeah, principal. Honestly. I'm going to keep this in my desk till the end of the school year <laughs> to see whether or not you learn how to use. Yeah. Robinhood. So the next challenge is how to figure out how to get that type of certificate directly to me since we know that Justin's a thief. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I still don't own any Southwest stock apparently. I did not include probably 20 more emails. Wow. We, this is yeah, amazing. We are, we are bordering on happening? the idea of actually if, because God knows how I you actually go to shareholder do meetings. Meet up now. We could actually be an outsized portion of the energy yeah. of a shareholder meeting, which is usually just a yeah. bunch of bankers who are doing it for their job. That I would but if we do. show up and we're like, Hey, it's a long weekend in Fort Worth, Texas, or whatever <laughs> Ramada that they're doing this in. Uh, we would be the life of the party. We would, we would. And I, like, I, I appreciate the the listener that sent the uh, the Elliot management thing earlier. Like, I would love to do an episode on the political orphanage. Just how does a, a board meeting work? Like, like we yeah, hear about these things it. in the news. I don't really understand them on a fundamental level. So all of this sounds great. To and we're me. willing to be bought off because mm-hmm. I, I, I think that we are in general. Uh, we have stood up for Southwest, or at least Jen, the only person who doesn't own stuff. I do yeah. love it. I do think it'd be fun to walk in there with a mob of people and mm-hmm. like be the customer av- advocates. Cause like, who knows if there's going to be any customer advocates in the room? Like yep. I would love to be loud and annoying and would piss you? off these. Would you Elliot buy Manning a share of stock love to do as it? Apparently South- I already own one no, thief. No, no. I have no memory of that. As a Southwest <laughs> stock owner, I don't want any rabble coming into my meeting. You will have to stay outside until you buy a stock and become a fellow shareholder. You look like someone that would represent Elliot I do. Management. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep, I do. I, Elliot Management, if you guys need a jester or a mascot. No, he looks he looks like the fail son that's squandering the fortune raised by <laughs> yeah. Elliot Management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I look like the guy that's taking Buying a lot. Buying his third alpaca farm. Yep, yep, I'm taking a lot of improv classes. And yeah. 
<laughs> he's got a lot of friends that say, you know, he's actually normal for a rich guy. <laughs> <laughs> From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. I'm Andrew Heaton. I'm Jen Briney. And we're not wrong on this edition of the program. We're going to talk about candidates U-turning from positions they took very stridently in 2020 on both sides of the aisle. And the number one restaurant in Austin, Texas being not real. Not at all real. All that plus Hardee's? your emails. <laughs> Hardee's is Carl's Jr. Get it straight. Oh. Well, it's both, right? So from what I understand. <laughs> Have they now transitioned all of the Hardys to Carl's Jr.? Well, I think the Karchers bought Hardy's. And so like Carl's Jr. is the bigger envelope that Hardy's is now underneath of, if I understand it correctly, which I might not. But okay. I think that's what's happening. Hmm. But they both have double Western bacon cheeseburgers and that's what matters. Yeah. I guess because they have the same menu. Right. As far as I've seen. Yeah. But well, I only they, they, order they, they the same ads. It's like they, there's an ad for Carl's Jr. And then they, at the end, it just says Hardee's and Carl's Jr. All I know is I went to a Hardee's looking for that because I saw the star. Right. And I was like, oh, Carl's Jr. And then I went and it looked like Carl's Jr. But it was called Hardee's. But they still had my burger. It tasted exactly the same. They had Chris cut fries. So that's all I need. So in my mind, they're the same restaurant. Maybe there are other things that people get at those restaurants. But those are the only things I've ordered for like 30 years. I've never been a regular at either i was outside of that regional footprint for for carl's jr or hardy's i was a habitual hanger out at hanger hanger outer at her hanger outer at her <laughs> at um the carl's jr it was walking distance from my house mm. growing up and so we used to like do you have you guys ever had a suicide of course yeah. oh yeah we, we got the multiple soft yeah, drinks yeah. the yeah. fountain drinks yep and so we would go there all the time. The staff actually kind of liked us because we were teenagers who tipped, but we were there oh. all, all the time. Yeah, it was the Taco Bell for us. Well, that's we had a Del Taco, out. but I'm, I wasn't I'm allowed a... to hang out at the Del Taco because that's where the Rebels were. The so, Rebels were at the Del Taco. Yeah, the Del Taco in Irvine, California was a thing, and I was not allowed to spend time there, but Carl's Jr. was okay. I'm an IHOP man. You go to IHOP late, you hit on some 50-year-old peroxide blondes, you have a good evening. That's what mm. I do. Go to IHOP. <laughs> I wasn't I think allowed I to be still out have that friends late. that are banned from the IHOP plantation. <laughs> <laughs> I know IHOP is for breakfast, but I feel like it's inappropriate to go there when the sun's out. Like that's a middle of the night type yeah, of for place sure. for yeah. me. I don't know. I would think Waffle Waffle House is what I think of more as the middle of the night thing. Waffle House. Can I Although, tell you guys something? Yeah. So I wasn't allowed. Well, it's not that I wasn't allowed to, but he didn't want to like have it affect his job. But I was actually friends with the CEO of Wall, uh, Waffle, Waffle House. House? I, Doug I, Waffle House? No, his name was Walt Emmer. He was a fan of Congressional Dish. And I just found out that he died. What? Uh, yeah, he was only 58 years old. He had cancer. I didn't even know. Oh it was very, very fast. And so I'm kind of sad. I've been having the sad I know Waffle that. House. I know that when you visited him and went to a Waffle House yeah. or, or he came oh, down to Oh, I do to remember Austin. that. Yeah. yeah. And he you got a bunch Waffle of House. Waffle House merch and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But wow, he uh, uh, died of cancer, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it was really fast. Um, but yeah, when I, so I've only been to Waffle House once and it was with the CEO. And what I really liked about him is when I walked into the restaurant, he was serving, <laughs> like he was helping the staff. And as we sat there and had breakfast, he introduced me to everyone that worked there. Um, the whole time we talked, he was talking about how much he loves the people because he like drives around from place to place all the time. And uh, he was really great American company. He, he was really he, he's, proud he's of a it. Great American. Yeah, I really I liked him and I could tell that the employees liked him. And um, and the swag bag he gave me was fantastic. Joe still wears his Waffle House shirt all over Austin, even though he's never been to a Waffle House. Um, but yeah, Walt Emmer, very good guy. And he's going to be Waffle missed. House has maybe the greatest food staff there is mm. uh largely because they are also frontline police officers yeah <laughs> like, we talked about that they too can, <laughs> they can make you breakfast in 12 minutes flat that will be as good as any other diner breakfast that you will get across the country uh with obviously a few exceptions for like exceptional kind of places that do things very very specifically well but he told you me their policy level, is it's all made fresh like yeah, that's they're always. proud of it always and they have taken out more rabble rousers than most <laughs> major. Like Fallujah is calmer 
in the aughts than a Waffle House at one o'clock in the morning when people come in acting a fool. Like, yeah. and, and a good Waffle House will be able to spot the troublemakers and they will just know. They will have like their metaphorical hand on the pistol from the second that somebody <laughs> walks in with wild eyes. Yeah, those some of those employees I could tell have handled situations. Well, the one by us what went viral, I think two years ago because there was a fight at the Oh Waffle yeah, House, I remember that. And mm-hmm. somebody threw a chair, the chairs are very light aluminum. And the reason why is because of what you see in this video where this woman who cannot weigh more, she is a small white woman, cannot weigh more than 110 pounds, catches this chair in midair like she's Thor in a Marvel movie. (laughs) Just hawks this fucking chair by the leg midair. And it's amazing. Yeah, that was a, it was a fun day and I'm, um. So this happened recently. Yeah. Yeah. It happened over the summer. I didn't know until a couple days ago. Wow. Yeah. Huge bummer. Well. Rest in peace, buddy. Yep. Let's talk about politics, huh? Kamala Harris is headed. us up, please. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Kamala Harris has had to distance herself from many of her 2019 positions uh, from that Democratic primary, among them a ban on fracking, mandatory gun buybacks, and taxpayer-funded transgender care for prisoners. But she's not alone. Some Republicans would also like to forget the 2020 season. Carrie Lake, the GOP nominee in Arizona for Kirsten Cinema's open Senate seat, is among them. She is currently polling, by average, 10 points behind Donald Trump, who's a favorite to win that state, largely because of her connection, Carrie Lake's connection, to the Stop the Steal movement and her failed run for governor in 2020 in 2022, where she refused to concede. And so I ask you, Jen. 2024 does seem to be punishing candidates who took extreme positions in the last cycle, or at least enough for them to react to it. Is that a good or bad thing? I like giving people the ability to change their minds, especially if it's well articulated and they seem to have good reasons for it. Um, So I don't think it's a bad thing if it's real. I really <laughs> well, like, now we're now we're into a slippery, de- <laughs> a slippery definitional place when it comes to politics on exactly how real anything is, because Kerry exactly. Lake's opponent in this race was selected because he was the true blue progressive because wishy washy Kirsten Cinema wasn't representing the Democrats well enough because she was too moderate. And now Ruben Gallego is wearing camo and sleeveless vests and talking about how he needs to build a wall that's higher than what Trump wants to build, because that's just where the mood of the electorate is. Yeah. I mean, I have a, I have a problem with the bullshittery in politics to begin with. So do I have a problem with people changing their positions? No, but do I have a problem with pandering? Yes. And I do think those are two different. How would you, things. how would you separate those? Well, so isn't that the problem? Like, cause that's what we as voters are trying to figure out. Is this person, do they mean it? Yeah. Is it a change of heart or is it pandering? And we are the ones who have to figure that out. Um, because once they get into office, as I have seen many times, they tell you one thing and they do something else with their when? actual power. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe back East, but you know, in yeah. America, no. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I, we're expected to have these crystal balls and like trying to figure out what these future humans are going to do. And so while it's, while a flip flop is frustrating, sometimes you learn shit. Um, I'm trying to think of, Oh, uh, Luna. I remember her name. Cause I think Luna tech every time I think of her, but she's representative Luna from Florida, Florida. and Anna, Anna Paulina Luna. Yes. That's the one. Um, she okay. very interesting Instagram. Oh, there's a lot of interesting things about this this huh? whack job. Oh, she she did like a a bikini like hot girls for Trump. Uh, yeah, thing. She, she's a member of Congress. Yep. Yes, okay. she is. Hotter or less hot than Bobert? Well, so I've seen Bobert in person, and I know that she's a teeny tiny peanut. So I used to think Bobert was really hot, and then I thought she was a child, and so I see her differently. Now. Okay, fair. Good. So I'm I don't know. glad that that's the position you took. Was she looks like a child? I'm less attracted to her. But see, I have changed my mind based uh-huh. on actual yeah. evidence, and I am okay with changing my opinion. But Anna Paulina Luna has been. Oh, sorry. Just, it was not a bikini. It was a Make America Great Again. She's pretty. One piece. She's definitely pretty. Um, but she's also a fire breathing partisan. She's unfair. Um, and yet 
she recently said because she said horrible things about Biden. She's called on him to resign for reasons that have nothing to do with his actual job performance. But then after Hurricane Milton, she actually had to work with the man and finally came out and said, like, he's he's doing a good job here. Like, he actually cares. And so it's like that's the type of thing where I can see why she changed her tune on that. That one feels kind of authentic to me, especially because it's probably going to piss off the people in her party. Um, there's other flip flops. J.D. Vance saying that he's now a Trump guy. Like, I'm still suspicious of that shit. That just feels opportunistic so, to me. So it's yeah, but on which side? So you think he he doesn't like Trump? He still secretly in his heart of in his little J.D. Vance heart of hearts hates him. I think he's made a deal with the devil. And as soon as he gets into office with the man, like everyone else who seems to have worked with him, he's going to see that Trump is disloyal. And eventually he'll be saying like, oh, I regret what I've done. But like he wants the power. That's my my guess with J.D. Vance, because he said a lot of things about Trump and those seemed true. And now that he's friends with his son and might be vice president, you can see why he might flip on that. So it's like you and I don't know. That's just an opinion. I could be completely wrong. I don't know, J.D. Vance. But this is what I'm saying, where it's like we as voters are the ones who are trying to figure out, like, is this a real opinion you have or is this pandering? Well, it sounds like authenticity is is your is your thing. So who would you consider to be an authentic politician? Somebody that you believe when Bernie Sanders, I believe pretty, pretty safe to see. He hasn't really backed off a lot of stuff. Mm -mm. Maybe this this is. Part of why I want the political Gun, process the to be. Bernie used to be pretty hard on guns in the border, and he's pretty much backpedaled away from that. But that, that was a slow burn. Even then, I'll give Bernie some credit. Like the uh, my my friend Joe Dorman ran for governor of Oklahoma as a Democrat a few years ago, lost, and I talked to him about how where do you draw the line between what the voters want, and what you want, where you're willing to overrule the voters, and he had a very straightforward position, which is I have a pie chart. And about half the stuff I think is not up for vote, like either elect me or don't elect me, but you're going to get it. I'm pro-choice or whatever, whatever he was. Yeah. About a quarter of it, I have my opinion, but I'll defer to the voters if they overrule me. And about a quarter, I don't know yet. And I'll just be informed by the voters. So I, I could see Bernie, I don't know if this is what he said. I could see Bernie going, look, like I have my own thoughts on gun control, but Vermont is overwhelmingly a pro-gun state and I'm I'm going to represent those yeah. views. That's pretty much what he said. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I think, I think um, uh, Bernie and Ron Paul are both examples of, of ideologues that have an ideological core, but they are the exception. This is part of the reason I mean, that- I can name a few more. Jeff Jackson of North Carolina, I trust him. Justin Amash, when he was a congressman, I trusted sure. him. Like they're, they're there, but we're struggling to grasp was this, those this, this is, yeah, this- Part of the a significant part of why I wish to limit the influence of the political process in day to day life is that I think most politicians are more in the how do I get elected camp. And to me, it feels like we're going to let the, the only people running the PTA are, are finance bros. And there are some good finance bros. There are some bad finance bros. There's a variation. But just I don't feel really great about putting the finance bros in charge of the PTA. And I think that's just kind of the nature of politicians is that there is a certain level of grandstanding and opportunism that, that tends to be built into the model itself. And well, the the people that we're talking about, I think, are exceptional. I don't think that they're standard. I mean, to be a politician is to be somebody who seeks to get elected, mm-hmm. to be a legislator to be a governor is to actually run the government. Those are two different jobs. And they are two. Yeah. I mean, and obviously they go hand in hand. Uh, There's probably a better term to kind of encapsulate all of it. Or colloquially, we can say that a politician kind of does both of those things. But specifically, when you're raising money, you're not raising money so you can be a better governor, except on the base level that you want to stay in that in that role, you know? Uh, uh, you're not writing policy. And our, our friends that have been in, uh, that are in Congress will often say, uh, you know, there's pretty, uh, a pretty slim amount of people that are actually kind of there to be there and are dialed in to legislate. You know, the, well, the, the ones that are really there to legislate, you don't know their names. Yeah. There's, like, there's, I just there's, thought there's of an- workhorses and show horses. So rather mm-hmm. than focusing on the authenticity, focusing on the, attention seekers versus the wonks. I mean, that's the distinction that goes a long way. And, and yeah, the, the workhorses you don't tend to hear about because they're in the background doing stuff. Yeah. Our, our listener that uh, took us on the uh, congressional tour, I think laid it out like, hey, there's 10% of people and, and there's not an ideological divide to it. 
that are really exceptional. Like mm -hmm. they really care about this. They really care about the country. They really care about how government works. They're reading the bills. They're writing <laughs> bills that are very specific. Then there's about 50 to 60% that are just kind of there. Like they could be talked into a smart thing. They could be talked into a dumb thing, but they're just kind of people on the bus. And then the rest of them are just the worst human beings on the end. This, uh, on, this on, completely yeah. comports with my yeah. analysis of yeah. Congress. Yep, I, I agree with this that. This is the House specifically. I don't know whether or not there's there's a difference. I mean, you know, the, the, the Senate's supposed to be an elevated discourse, but, but the House specifically was his point of view that there's like 15% of people that are just like will make you want to never be involved in public service again. I mean, I think that translates to the Senate too. Cause like, um, when I want to know what's happening with policy, like Patty Murray is someone that would come to my head. I would go to her website to see, but like, she's not that famous. She's just like doing appropriations. You know, Jim McGovern is one of my favorite people in the house has been for 12 years and he is rules committee cares about the institution, big on food stamps. Like, um, these are not the fame horse. They're the ones writing the legislation, trying to get the Congress to work. And it's it's kind of a shame that we don't know their names and we don't know their work because those are the ones that are actually. They would give you more faith in government if we looked at them as examples and said, like, OK, that's what I want representing me. Is there so I, I think everything just boils down to incentives. And so I, I look at this and go the the sorts of people who are typically going to be attracted to politics is going to have a mix of activists and ideologues, but there's going to be a higher proportion of opportunists and narcissists. So like, I, I don't, what, what could we do in order to incentivize people? Like for, for me right now, it's just baked into it. And that's part of why I'm, the, the default is no, when we want to expand the government, you have to convince me why it should be, because I'm like, I don't want to put these people in charge of it. Um, but, uh, but it would be nice if there was some way to, to get, um, uh, people that are publicly servicely minded to, to go in instead of the fame seekers. Maybe we can just have you judge them as people. <laughs> now that you're going to be in D.C., this is going to be a lot easier. You know, like they get elected, but first they have to be weighed and measured by Andrew mm -hmm. Heaton. And if well, you what, deem them worthy, what, what then, I, you, then you send them to their job. What, what if I, not, try again, Missouri. Well, what, what I had to do when I was living in D.C. last time is uh, I had to develop a kind of um, – bifurcated mind on politicians because politicians are exceptionally good at getting you to like them. So I, I now, as somebody in media, uh, I now gird my loins by going into the room with the <laughs> expectation that I am going to like the person that I'm, I'm any, any politician I meet Republican, Democrat, whatever. I anticipate that I'm going to walk out of there going, you know, I really like her. I think yeah. she's a really nice lady. And, and what I, what I do to try to protect myself is be able to in advance go, I don't agree with her politics. I don't know that I would vote for her, but I would hang out with her socially because I, I do find that they tend to be very, very likable across the board. Well, yeah, because you have to be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, like you, again, get, that's you get flushed out built into the, the garden you, variety politician. Yeah. If you, if you drop a politician in a room and they can't be kind of the life of the party, if, if, if at some point most everybody isn't kind of clamshelled around them, letting them hold court, then you're probably not going to go very far because you need to do a lot of that. You need to do a lot of glad handing. You need to do a lot of talking to people and making them believe when you, that you, you can you go. You can get around that, but there's a trade-off. So like if you look at British politics, the British don't have primaries or they're, they're kind of introducing them, but they're they're late to the game on this. What, what they do is they have the old smoky back room, except it's pipes because it's Britain, mm -hmm. where yeah. the, the the Tories will, like the, the seven people in the Tory council of Sussex will get together and go, well, George is a good fellow. We should put him in. And, and that's it. He just has to convince those six people to do it. And so the British can have more of a gap in terms of the likability and the personability, because if you're in a safe seat and you've been hand selected by your council, you don't actually have to go get elected. You're just para dropped into it. The, the upshot is you can get people that are very talented in a parliamentary system who are very intelligent policy wonks. The downside is that they're also far more removed from the democratic process and from the actual will of the people. So there's this kind of this sort of spectrum of how removed from the democratic process do you want people to be versus how how involved do you want them to be? But the, for, the more removed you get, the more bureaucratic you get, the more you get the Pentagon and the State Department. Jen? I don't know. Just turning this into like a whole, like, I don't think that we naturally have to have these attention whoring type people. I think one of the reasons we have this is that we reward it. Like, Politics is the job application for a job that doesn't really fit that skill set. 
And so when we have these people that are attention whores, we hire them and they're like, why are they bad at legislating? It's like, cause we're not really factoring that into the job application. Like we really do treat this as a personality contest. And so I think because our politics are broken, we get broken government. I don't think that either of those things are broken by their natures. How would I, you suggest changing it? I would suggest that people that cover politics ask more substantive questions and focus oh, less it's on our s- fault. It's the media's fault. You know, it kind of is. Oh, it kind of Come is on. because we Come focus on. on the stupid shit. We do. That's what people want. And this we is what give I'm talking the people about. what they want. OK, so you're you're appealing to the lowest common do- denominator, like the people you you think that we want the fluff instead of feeding us what we need. You're giving people so what they want. More paternalistic. Not paternalistic, but more detail. Sorry, dumbs. We won't give the quote that's interesting to you and the, the, the subjects that you care about. No. You know what's also interesting is what's actually in the bills that they have voted on while in office. You know what's interesting is what they made laws. That is work to dig up. And I know like I know covering quotes is like fun and it's like show. But like we do need to focus on the actual legislative part in our politics. And we fucking don't. We focus on campaign rallies and what they say as opposed to what we do. And I would like to see more people who cover politics spending times on the campaign buses going through some legislation and asking more specific questions. Because right now it's just about what do you say you're going to do as opposed to what have you already fucking done? And that's why they get away with messaging bills. It's why they get away with votes that they say don't matter. Like they're getting away with horrible things in Congress because the spotlight isn't there the spotlight is on the show. I want the spotlight more on the job than on the show. I, I agree with you that there can be an evolved version of this where you at least the the media could be more on put together on the same message of like, hey, if this thing is stupid, if this is obviously just a messaging bill, then don't cover it like it actually matters. Like cover it like it is a an attention grabbing thing and then ask okay yeah but when are you going to conference with something that could get to 60 and then also pass the house mm-hmm. like right now there there is a lack of that and i do think it's because you know the vast majority of people that care about political news are partisan and so they are incentivized to hear the story of the brave blameless struggles of their side against the villainous dead-eyed opposition. And so they want to hear about how the Democrats tried to preserve IVF when it was not a fucking mess. It was not a real bill and they didn't want a conference with the Republicans who had a competing bill that couldn't be brought up. Like they just want to hear that that, because they want to repeat it and they want their team to win. And that's just the reality of, of what, drives traffic. It's it's what uh, uh, the people who are paying attention to those outlets want. Now, is there a place where we could put that the better information to people that aren't necessarily partisans? Maybe. I, I got three tiny suggestions that I think would help. One one sounds weird, but I've, I thought about this a while. I think student councils are a really bad idea. Um, like in, in high school. Let's fucking go. Yeah, All right. I, I think I, think, I right. wasn't expecting that. Finally, no, no, these no. nerds have these nerds have fucked around for too long. Yeah. Well, no. What? what okay. Like I, I did student council in high school. Drag them. What? What does what student council teach you? Student council teach you that government is about getting elected and it has no consequences and it's a popularity contest. Yeah. Does that sound like anything yeah. we deal with on a regular basis? So yeah. my thought would be, if I ran for student government twice just because I could say whatever I wanted on the morning announcements. Like, like I, I, <laughs> you would. I, I think I think it's I, I honestly think it's a horrible lesson to be teaching students. It's a horrible lesson to tell them that yeah. your, your vote has no consequences, that you're just voting for Skippy because Skippy's your friend. And that's it. There's not, there's the, the actual governance is handled by some ethereal authority that's above you. Um, like th- there is, there is no principle in the actual world. There is no principle. The highest level of maturity in the world is the student council. That's it. All you're ever doing is electing student council members. There's no principle that is the government. It's always kids, right? So being aware of that, I think teaching kids that it is a uh, an exercise in voting and that's it is actually really destructive to understanding the political process. And I would either give them a seat on the board of uh, the school board, like let the students actually have somebody on there who could potentially fuck shit up, and let them learn their lesson, 
or, um, or don't let them do it at all. And just be honest and tell them like, yeah, we don't fucking trust you enough with anything to let you vote on this. But this whole idea of we're, we're going to teach you the, 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 the voting process, which you also already know how to do is some sort of weird aping. I, I think it's a really bad idea. Uh, another thing I would do, we've talked about this previously is we shouldn't be allocating chairmanships based on the discretion of the speaker and committees, because then it just becomes a rush to earn money for the party. Most of the people that are running for Congress are not uh, raising money for themselves. They're in safe seats. Most of them are raising it for the party, and that's how they get their chairs. And so you 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 could do that internally right now. It wouldn't require a constitutional amendment. Um, and uh, uh, I had some third one. I now forget it, but I'm sure I could do it. Uh, I, I don't think that we'd ever be able to like come up with a system that just bifurcates only selfless, um, egoless people who run for office. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think that the people that are going to be attracted to politics are invariably going to be disproportionately extroverted, ambitious people. Those are going to be the personality types that gravitate towards elected office. And I think that there's also just a kind of hierarchical distribution which will happen in society where the higher you get, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector, the less affected by shame you are. When I talk to people that work in politics, I find that mayors tend to be much more attuned to public shaming than senators do. Um, mayors want to get along with everybody. Senators really, to get elected to the Senate, you have to be able to stomach pissing people off. And that means that you have a great advantage if you can piss people off for your benefit. So I don't think we're ever going to get away from that. I, I think it's kind of built in. And so I do want to I do want to try to incentivize it to be in a good direction. There are things we can do. But I, I, I think that I, I am beginning with the reality in my mind that we're always going to have ambitious, potentially opportunistic, egotistical people that are going to be attracted to running for office. Uh, uh, to to uh, get to high school reform, uh, which I, I also have a, a pitch for it that is adjacent to that. Maybe it's it could even be in in lieu of a, a student council or student government. I th- I think that it would be very beneficial, would have been beneficial to me if you take all the kids in, let's say, your senior year when it's a little lighter in terms of like you've already done whatever standard standardized tests for people who want to go to college and stuff like that. And you say, all right, Two weeks, we are going to put you all in pairs and you're going to get $500 to write a business plan and come up with an idea of what to do. And we're going to give you guidance uh, based on what you want to do with it. We're going to generally kind of like have like loose framework of you do need a budget. <laughs> you do need to show like certain elements. But then for the next two weeks, no class. You can do whatever you want for that business. but you've got to show that you have invested the money into it and that it has some kind of uh, uh, some kind of return. And if you do not, then you're going to come to essentially summer school. And so we're just going to give you, you know, kind of busy work. So it, you are allowed to stay out there as long as you are able to function it. And the benefit, I think, would be number one, A, treating money as something that is real and can go away which is something that really, really benefited me. I did not have a sense of what money was until in college when I became editor of the Daily Orange, which at that time, I don't know where it is now, was a half million dollar not-for-profit corporation that I was the CEO of, that I got when I ascended to that. I now had a board of directors that were helping me, you had alumni, you had some professional people, but I was the one making the calls. And I was 21 and it, made me very, very uh, cognizant of the idea that the decisions I made were not only benefiting me, it was benefiting, you know, the the institution as a whole. So I don't know. I, I do think that the concept of fake student government, probably teaching kids the wrong, the wrong lessons, which is that this really doesn't matter. And if you just yell and scream loud enough, like that's something that'll get you attention. And a good lesson is, hey, for you, your life, and the institutions that you were going to interact with, take it seriously and understand that, you know, uh, good things come from investment and hard work. Yeah. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm still just stuck on this idea that, like, we can demand more of our politics than the fluff that we're well, but I mean, we're given like one of the reasons I think you're right, Justin, like one of the reasons it's like this is because so many people that get into covering po- politics are partisans. That's why what Justin does, I think, is quite valuable. He just calls balls and strikes. He's like not on either team. 
But the reason they get into partisanship is because it's lucrative, because we pay for it, because we listen to it, because we we feed into that system. If we demanded better, if we supported the people that are doing better, we might get better. And I think that as these people are going out and trying to win the job through the popularity contest, if in their preparation, they knew that they had to know this bill backward and forward, if they knew that they had to justify these votes that they took, which really did look like this was a corporate favor and not really something that helped their constituents, if they had to justify what they did in the last two years, I think they'd be a lot more careful when they took those votes, knowing that they'd be questioned about it. But as it is now, they can do all kinds of shit in Congress and know that it's never going to come up. No one's going to bring it up to them. No one's going to challenge um, them on this on a stage or on a TV interview. It's like their governing job just is completely disconnected from the running. And that is something that we not only in the media can do something about, but also as voters, we can educate ourselves. And when we go and take the microphone and ask questions at these rallies, we can be the ones to be like, hey, you voted this way. And the way I understand this bill, this doesn't represent me well. Why did you do this? Our questions can make these differences. But instead, we're asking about, you know, whatever nonsense. Anna Paulina is, Luna's butt in the one piece. Yep. We're asking it's about nice whatever butt. nonsense is in the. Look at his butt, though. OK, Justin. I'll, I'll make a pitch for her. If, if the Republicans, <laughs> if the Republicans nice are going to nominate conspiratorial gas bags as their candidates, they might as well elect ones with good cleavage. Like, I mean, like, seems to me if we're going to get a guy shaped like a fucking bathtub that's going to get up there and ramble about nonsensical bullshit, I'd rather replace him with a lady in a, in a bathing suit that looks good. Well, it does make uh, me and, wonder. And, like, at least we met in the middle. <laughs> It makes me wonder how, like, we just said that it's all a popularity contest, right? But, like, no one likes Ted Cruz. I saw Gerald Nadler. He's a weird-looking, tiny bowling ball of a human being. Mm -hmm. Like, he's not the handsome varsity athlete that you would expect when, but you know, like. But they say the thing. They say the thing that the people want to hear. What? The thing. No one oh. likes these people. Uh, they don't like them. But boy, do people, they like the thing. People like partisanship. I don't like this at all. I, I just wrote a fucking book about this. I don't like it at all, but people like partisanship. Oh, it's called Tribalism <laughs> is Dumb. Thank you for asking, Justin. I, I commend it to everybody. It will explain why this is built into our system. Uh, Great reviews. Thank you. Um, but the, the reason that the media it acts so horribly is because that's what people want. The, the, the media is going, oh, you want like wedge issue culture war bullshit? We'll provide that to you. It's just a big conveyor belt of what you want. So it, it, the, the, the thing that, that I'm, that I find myself going with is, is again, I'm, I'm very much concerned with structures and incentives. And I, I agree with you morally, Jen, that, that we all ought to do better. We ought to be better in media. We ought to be better as voters. We ought to have more selfless politicians that are representing us. But the way my mind works, I just don't think do better is ever going to affect anything. Like there has to be some sort of structural change to get an actual That's change. That's exactly what I said. Like okay. each one of us can make a difference by asking better questions when we get to talk to these people. We can like in the media, we can be the people that make sure that they are held accountable for their votes as voters. When we write to our Congress, first of all, you have to write to Congress. You have to communicate with them. Or if you show up to the rally, like be the person that doesn't ask about, you know, something broad like inflation, but asks about the specific vote. Why did you take this vote? Inform every single person sitting in that room with a, you know, one paragraph thing that you were very careful to write that explains the the issue, the bill, whatever, tell them what the vote, like we can do better. And if all of us were doing this or more of us were doing this, that could shift the focus of these people from, oh, I don't really have to worry that people are watching my job performance in Congress. I only have to worry that they're watching television and they're watching the punditry. If they were feeling it on the campaign trail based on individual actions as in like, I am watching you right now and I'm going to hold you accountable in public. I do think that is a actionable thing that we could do to shift it more in the, this is a job application. Politics is a job application. It's not treated as such. But if we treated it as such, I actually think it could change things. I think pitch to you, because I think that you are a great uh, uh, avatar for this. What if once a year on Congressional Dish, you wrote a good faith letter 
to somebody that is representing you. And let's say right now, maybe the representative is somebody that you align more with, but if you could find something that you disagree with or that you have a general question about, or maybe, you know, Ted Cruz, let's say Ted Cruz wins, he is your Senator here in Texas, write a, a good faith letter. So not one that is necessarily like hyperbolic or, or uh, accusatory, but something that is pointed, uh, just asking, I have very big questions about why you took this vote and read the letter aloud on Congressional Dish as a model for other uh, listeners to do the same to theirs and make it something that I don't know, make like make it make a day out of it. Like it's write, funny write, write, I, write, write, write your congressman. Day. I actually did that. I didn't I don't I didn't read it out loud, but I was writing like sample letters for some of these bills like 12 years ago when no one was listening to the show and I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But that was something that I was bring it back, baby doing. Um, I, I think, yeah, you could, you, I mean, that you could, could be help. A good be, be the change that you want to see in the world. And, and, you know, you do a good job of breaking down these bills. I do think that part of what makes your show good is that you put in a little, little spice, a few of the golf swings, you know, uh, you, you were not a bloodless avatar, uh, or, or a bloodless. You know, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I can be more diplomatic in writing. I know that. Well, no, but, but also you can say like, Hey, you guys know who I am. You know, my perspective, I have not hidden my points of view on things from you. Still, what I want is a substantive response from my elected representative. So yeah. I'm going to write it. I'm going to read it on the podcast. I'm going to tag their offices in it. And I would encourage you guys to do the same. And the best ones that I think are also really interesting and well-written, I'll put my social media clout behind to say to, to everybody else, hey, this is a good, well-written letter. I would like for these this to be interesting. Because right now, we can complain about the media, quote unquote, but the media is not what it used to be. The gatekeepers are not what, they don't have the power that they used to. And the one thing that is real is that we are all in our different niches. Yeah. And so what you are very much in control of is the niche of people that want to write pointed letters to their Congress people that are in good faith. And mm -hmm. if you can, and if you can build that up, it will become just as powerful as other elements that are, you know, there's no more fringe in our media world. Everything is just its own little pocket. The only question is how loud and interesting they are. And for the first time ever, there's an idea that I feel like gives me a reason to have a stub sub stack because writing those letters could work. Patreon.com slash where not wrong <laughs> is where you need to go if you want to support this show. Huh. You know, they put out a survey. Who's they? Patreon. Oh, I thought it was... Particular they, ethnic group. They. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't say which. <laughs> now, Patreon put out a, a survey. I'm not saying that I caused it, but it was two days after I announced mm. my Substack, and it was a survey asking about the procreation billing and how people felt about it and how much they knew about it and how much they oh, didn't know about it. I had pointed words. Okay, anyway. I'll look for it and fill it out because I'm still pissed off. Yeah. Patreon.com slash we're not wrong is where you need to go to get our bonus episode. And this week it's going to be about the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. Finally, oh. I have thoughts. Oh, good. <laughs> when I sent when I sent the group chat with the prep doc, I felt my hair brussel back behind my ears, and it was because of Andrew Heaton's boner that had disturbed <laughs> the air. Mm -hmm. In the Austin area, because he was so excited to talk about the Alien Enemies Act of 1798, which okay. is in the news. Good. And has, I to, saw that has to do with extraterrestrials. That's the thing nobody's talking about, but that's the, the use of the word alien. <laughs> but you won't know unless you cross that Patreon threshold. I knew that was an Andrew question. Patreon.com slash we're not wrong is where you need to go. Ethos. An Instagram account claiming to represent Austin's number one restaurant has fooled over 73,000 followers with images of AI-generated dishes and fake staff. Despite the enthusiasm from commentators, Ethos ain't real. Its website promotes fake reservations with redirect users to a meme page. When approached for an interview, Ethos responded that they could not answer press requests as they were preparing for a Michelin star review. The account features pictures of croissant sculptures and high-end dishes, as well as a chef holding up a massive sausage. 
Andrew Eaton, uh, on your last night in Austin, would you eat at Ethos if it were real? Absolutely, I would. Ab, did you go to the Instagram? It looks amazing. It looks amazing and kind of weird. And I've I've put a lot of odd things in my body over the last ten years. Uh, I would. I would. Is that why you had to gird your loins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I gotta for well for the benefit of everybody. I gotta gird my loins. You know, like yeah, I, I I've been to Cleveland. Uh, uh, yeah, I would totally eat there. It looks really good. And, uh, uh, also I'm fairly adventurous in my eating uh, or, or rather when I'm on adventures, like I've eaten two beating rattlesnake hearts in my life. What the fuck are you, Andrew Heaton? Your stories. Like every time I think I've heard the weirdest one, Have I, I told haven't. you my rattlesnake stories. Well, I knew that you like <laughs> went and grabbed them and threw them in bags. Like I've heard mm-hmm. yeah. that, yeah, yeah. but you didn't tell me that you ate their beating yeah, but, but hearts me, like a psycho. Me, me, me and Evan went to the, the uh, butcher shop afterwards. This was for listeners that don't know of which we speak. We're talking about the Mangum <laughs> Rattlesnake Derby in Southwest Oklahoma, God's country. Obviously. And uh, we, Obviously. Uh, after we went rattlesnake. Hell hunting, of a halftime show. <laughs> we, we went, we were just walking around and there was like a hand-drawn crayon butcher shop, $3 entry sign. And we were like, we'll go in. And there was this hulking dude inside covered with snake guts that had like a rattlesnake nose piercing, rattlesnake earrings. Uh, And he looked at Evan and he's like, my man, did you know uh, snake gallbladders are a delicacy in Southeast Asia? And he talked Evan into eating this gallbladder. And I was like, I'm not going to eat gallbladder. And he's like, but that heart right there has been beating for over two hours. It's a very high quality heart. It's been still good. I was like, oh, it's a pretty good pitch there. So yeah, popped it. And uh, how big was it? Oh, it's like maybe half. Uh, let me think about about a quarter of the size of your thumb knuckle. I don't know. Like like it's like maybe penny in diameter. A little, little, little bigger than a Tic Tac. Yeah, maybe maybe like five Tic Tacs put together that okay. size. Yeah, like a blueberry. Ye, not. Yeah, like a misshapen blueberry. And you don't feel it beating as you go down. And, uh, and then we, did you chew it or just swallow? No, I swallowed it. It was very gristly. And I, I came back a couple of years later and like, see, saw the same guy. And he's like, you want to have a, a, a beating snake heart? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And he's like, well, I'll let you pick it. And he just starts whacking heads off rattlesnakes. Oh. And he's like, you just let me know when you want one. Like we're at red lobster picking lobster Ooh. and he's, oh. he's whacking the heads off. And then the last one, he puts his hat in front of it and the disembodied head of the rattlesnake like hopped and bit the hat. And I was like, that's a fighter. I want that snake in me. Hell yeah. So ba- ate that one. Then I was in Vietnam and went to the Le Pen snake village. This old dude came out and uh, he didn't speak any English, but I, I had my little translator app and I said like, would like to eat snake because that's what they're famous for. So he came out and he shows me the snake like a wine bottle. And I was like, yes, that is a snake. And then he just turns around and brains it on a table. Then he slid it open and he squeezed it into a moonshine, like a plastic moonshine jug and gave me this snake juice. When you would oh. think the moonshine would negate the snake bile. Wow. No, it enhances it. So anyway, point is- I That's not some, what I would think of if you said the phrase snake juice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to vomit. So I've, and I had a bunch of bugs in Cambodia, which was fine. Uh, anyway, point is, this is all minor stuff. Like honeycomb cheesecake sounds great. I would eat that. Yeah, I mean, the question's confusing because the stuff looked pretty good. Actually, my question for you guys, did you ever see this in the wild? Like, were you ever on Instagram and one of those came up? No, no. Because it did for me really? and for Joe. Yeah, so Joe saw the so- dinosaur croissant and thought that was cool and like mental noted it. And then for me, I saw the hot dog that had cheese and pepperoni on top. Yeah. But I thought it was a different restaurant. When I came here for the first time in 2011-ish, there was a hot dog place and actually the physical building. I just saw it. It's still here. It's closed. Back when I was here, it was huge and it was on its own. And now it's like sandwiched between two towers. So you really I didn't know it was there. Um, and they had a bunch of weird hot dogs. So I assumed that was the hot dog place, but it was this bullshit place. And I was like, oh, like, I wonder if they merge with the hot dog. Like, I had all these questions. And then you sent this and I was like, oh, the whole this thing was kind fake. of like a big story. It was covered by by national media. And I but think like, why? Why are we talking about it? Like, I think it's because it just fits into the Venn diagram of things that people want to talk about. Austin's a hip city. It is this kind of up and coming place that has a tech focus to it. Everybody wants to think about 
dumb hipsters being tricked into a thing. And so that's a funny narrative of like 70,000 uh, uh, brunch hoppers just got fooled, LOL. So it gives you a little. It's it's journalist clickbait. Like, like yeah. what, so when I worked um, for Fox Business, something that I noticed is ju- hosts on TV love, they love discussing dumb bad guy stories. Like dumb criminal stories yes. are the best thing in the world because there's built in justice and it's funny. And I didn't have to write the joke. The joke's built in. So they love like a uh, guy tries to rob bank and writes, give me your money on his own business card and leaves it there. And then they could be like, guess you shouldn't have done that guy. Like they love that shit because because the people love that shit. They get to sound smart and yeah. funny. And so like the, the gotcha stuff does well. And this is also like the softest, most delicious way you can talk about like AI misinformation. Yeah, right? so true. it's also it's also that it's, kinda, is, it's this benign. Is, this, is, this is the like Candyland version of our democracy is going to be subverted because people made an AI picture, but now it's a croissant of Mu Dang. He's cute little croissant. Are you familiar with Mu Dang? That would be the hippo chef that was featured on the Instagram poem. The, the just the hippo. It was it, it, the, there was a real big chubby little hippo that is famous on the internet right now called Mu Dang. Oh. And so this was a croissant version of Mu Dang. Nice. What are your thoughts on this, Justin? Because I still can't figure out why you wanted this to be a topic. I'm just because I, I got to talk about it. Do three <laughs> political stories. <laughs> are you tired? <laughs> That's why. No, because it's going to be a fucking Rocky email thing too. So oh, I, wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to clear yeah. the palette a little Wait. bit so we could, we can move on from it. J- Jen, have, have you been to Snuffy's since you've come down here? <laughs> Snuffy's. I, that's your bullshit. <laughs> no, it's not bullshit. It's a real restaurant where oh the, my God, the, can you, can, the waiters and waitresses ride horses when they take your order and deliver it to you. That's Snuffy's. It's a wonderful why restaurant. Does, I actually know the owner, Tom Snuffhauser. Why does guy. Snuffy's not have an Instagram? Oh, that's filled actually, with pictures. I'm going to talk to Snuffhauser about that. Because, you, because Snuffy, Snuffy's does uh, have, especially for the Christmas special, which yeah. they, which they uh, sponsor. Yeah. My Christmas year. special every year is brought to you by Snuffy's off Route 44. Uh, I know that some of the listeners have put together a um, a Google Google Maps location yep. for Snuffies, which I find really funny because they got the address wrong. And <laughs> so it's just like an abandoned gas station. And if you look at the reviews, it's alternating between people who clearly listen to my show and very angry dads who are on a road trip that are like, this isn't a diner. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this this say it's a horse themed diner? It's an abandoned gas station. Oh my God. So people are like getting off the highway <laughs> and then driving out and they're like, what the fuck? I just gassed my kids up on them being fed food by horseback and it's just an abandoned Texaco. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice snuffies. Uh, no, I will do that on Instagram. That sounds like a great idea. Oh my God. Or I'll, again, I'll talk to Tom Snuffhauser. Talk, talk to he'll, Snuffhauser. Yeah. He's yeah. got to get that because I mean, now with the, with the, the photography that's available for sure. snuffies. Plus they just, oh, you, they you just can really bring it to finished life. using their my, MySpace page. So they're looking for something new. Mm, good. We're not wrong pod at gmail.com. I just blew up the bathroom at Ethos. We're not wrong pod at gmail.com. Heaton is a fraud, right? Kim Cattrall was in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. However, she did not portray Lieutenant Savick. She was not in that movie at all. She played Valeris, who was also a Vulcan. You know, um, I've done things I regret in the past. <laughs> One time I, uh, I scissor kicked Judy Dench. I jacked, <laughs> off, I jacked off a horse when I was in college, but the fact that I got... Savic confused with Valeris is I, I I feel like my virginity just grew back. Uh and uh, uh wait, hold on. No. No, the other way. The other way. Yeah. I, I you're I've, fucking too much. I've, I now those now, balls are too light. That's right. Now I've I've lost it. Yeah. <laughs> um uh listener, I apologize to you and I apologize to all of the other nerds for for bungling a very, very easy point. I, old, I cannot old, believe I did that. Old outsell Heaton. <laughs> Election night pitch writes, if Kamala's win anthem for the night uh, as she wins states isn't the coconut song from Reservoir Dogs, I will fight each and every one of you. I like that, although I don't know the coconut. I know I Reservoir Dogs. I'm in the coconut and drink it all up. Yeah. Yeah. The she never the played that at the DNC. That would have been I funny. Said, Doctor. I don't know how much she likes the coconut thing. Well, she should lean into it because people think it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to talk to her. 
Stock up writes, please let Eaton know that I bought his book and I'd be fascinated to learn the metadata, the metadata on the type of people that have bought it. And what they put below is the top picks for you after buying Heaton's book. And it's all prepper material. <laughs> it is all 50 pound jugs of ready to eat meals in case the apocalypse comes. I would I would love to see the 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 demo as that develops of the interesting subgroups that read my book. But yes, the kickoff appears to be a. Uh, Charming black tie preppers. Let's get into the climate stuff. Paradise found, right? Paradise, California is not gone. My brother and sister-in-law still live on the family uh, almond orchard and teach middle school in paradise. They were teaching during the fires and have scary stories of getting their students and themselves to safety. It has changed, but it's not gone. There are whole episodes uh, or more worth of debates on how much climate change, I hate that nebulous term, versus other factors called the campfire and their relative responsibility. It's unfair to use paradise as an example as to why we need to lurch toward draconian fossil fuel restrictions. Uh, Would you read the second one too? Because I have words for both these people. Writes, I understand Jen is passionate about climate change and the inaction by politicians, but saying that, quote, entire American cities are gone like Lahaina is extremely disingenuous. I just got back from a week long trip in Maui and we drove through and ate in Lahaina several times. Are there portions missing due to the fire? Yes, I'm not disputing that. In fact, being there and seeing the devastation up close was heartbreaking. But the city as a whole is not, quote unquote, wiped off the map. Far from it. All right. Settle in, boys, because these two. (laughs) These two. All right. So let's start with paradise. Um, I remember that fire. I remember the day of that fire. It was November of 2018. Um, for people who don't understand paradise at the time I was living in the San Francisco Bay area. Paradise is about two hours North and East of the San Francisco Bay area in the mountains. On that night, I was in Monterey, which is about two hours South and West of the San Francisco Bay area. These are not close together. And I was with a group of friends. We were going to run a half marathon the next morning. And so we had all gone to Monterey the night before. We were going out to a restaurant to carbo load. And we smelled a little bit of smoke in the air. We're like, hmm, that's a little weird. By the time we finished dinner and we walked outside, it was super thick. And by the time we got back to the hotel, there were signs all over the place saying they had canceled the half marathon. And when we looked at the TVs, we found out why. Because it was not just like trees that were being burned a four hour drive from where we were. It was cars and homes and people. The Paradise Fire, it took out 90% of that town. So is it still on the map? Sure. Six years later, are they rebuilding? Yes. And I hope this goes very well for these people. But there were 85 people who couldn't escape that were burned alive in Paradise. That town will never be the same. It's uh, when I talk about towns getting wiped off the map, I'm talking about consequences, right? And then when you talk about Lahaina, I mean, whoever wrote this in, are you unaware that I lived in Hawaii? Like this one actually is, is personal to me, tourist, because when you went to Lahaina, did you go to the old courthouse? Like, did you see the lighthouse? Did you walk down front street? Did you get your free cookie at the cookie company? Did you go to Fleetwoods or the Fish House? Did you go to any of the art galleries? Or did you go to Moose McGillicuddy's and look at the decades worth of stuff that they had collected and put up on the walls? I bet you don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about because all of those things are gone. Historic Lahaina Town is gone along with most of it. In fact, I checked this this morning. If you go on Google Maps right now as I'm speaking, And you type in Lahaina, what Google Maps is going to do is it's going to have a red line that outlines Lahaina for you. And the picture, the satellite picture that is currently up there is from within days of the fire. You can actually still see the burned out cars on the road. And you can see that, yes, some houses, especially in the north part of Lahaina, are still standing. The fucking McDonald's did survive and so did the Safeway. And I know that there are still some buildings there because I have a friend in Lahaina She lives in Lahaina right now, currently, as in her house survived. But her children's school is gone. She's a wedding planner. She has her office in historic Lahaina town in between all the art galleries. That office is gone. And more importantly, there's entire neighborhoods that are gone, more than entire neighborhoods. Look at the satellite photo that's up there right now. Most of Lahaina is gone. And we lost more than 100 people. And no matter what you do with the buildings, no matter even if they built 
every single one of them as exact replicas of, of what was there before, a hundred people are dead. And that is a town that will never, ever recover what it was. Never recover what it was. When I talk about wiping a city off a map, most of this audience seems to understand that that is a, a phrase. But what I'm talking about is consequences. And it's consequences of a lot of different decisions. So like in Paradise, there was a lot of different decisions that led to that. California deciding to privatize their energy grid. And even though PG&E has killed people before, allowing them to keep that privilege of running the grid. And yet they didn't maintain their lines that sparked that fire. That was a part of what happened there. The people that designed Paradise only had one road. That was a part of what happened there. But also there was an epic drought. As we had been warned for 50 years would become more common if we kept burning fossil fuels. That was a part of it. There are consequences to societal decisions that the people of Paradise had to pay. And I think it's gross to, man to minimize those consequences for them. And then in Lahaina, there were water diversion decisions that were made. In fact, I'm guessing tourist that when you said you ate in Lahaina several times, I'm guessing you were in Kaanapali. It's a little bit north of Lahaina, but that's where the resorts are. That's where tourists like you go. But you do not know Lahaina because it's no longer standing. But there were decisions that were made that did lead to this. But there was also yet again, a drought that we had been warned for decades would be worse in situations like this. <sighs> And when I look at both of these decisions that people have written in to basically tell me that I'm exaggerating the consequences of these people, that, that you say that, you know, these aren't justifications for a lurch towards draconian fossil fuel restrictions. Like, let's think about the consequences of the fossil fuel restrictions that we're talking about here. You know, we're talking about electrifying our transportation. Right now in your home, everything you have is powered by electricity. Your lights, your air conditioner, your kitchen appliances, everything. Has that been too draconian for you? Has that been too harsh for you? All we're talking about is putting some electricity in your car. And I'm someone who's already been living under this draconian reality. And I can tell you that I fucking love it because I haven't filled up the gas tank part of my car since January. We are recording this in mid-October. And that is because I just have one battery part of my car. I can get around 50 miles and that's plenty for just bopping around my town. That's what we're trying to do. And even if you want to keep your fossil fuel guzzler, what people are trying to do is just require the car companies to use technologies they already have to make it so that you don't have to buy and burn as much gas. It's going to save you money. What are you fighting against? And when it comes to the power plants, why do you give a fuck what happens at a power plant that's far away as long as your lights and your TV and your air conditioners work? Like all the, the only repercussions, the only consequences that you are going to suffer is that maybe your air and water will get cleaner because we're not burning fossil fuels. But if you have wind and solar, like what do you care? These are not draconian restrictions that are going to have consequences for you at all. But if you're saying that the people of Paradise and the people of Lahaina, that the consequences they suffered are not that bad, that that's that that is somehow a a better outcome than you having better gas mileage in your car. Like, I can't I can't understand you. So I found both of these emails. Minimizing of the consequences other people had to pay, and I hope you never have to experience this. But what I'm trying to prevent is more of these situations in the future, because it's not just fires. We picked two fires here with these emails, but right now we know that there are, we don't know how many people there are, but they're still collecting bodies all over Appalachia because a hurricane hit Florida and drowned so many towns in the mountains. We don't know how many towns are left. Talk about wiping towns off the map. They're under mud. There are consequences to continuing to burn fossil fuels. That was the point I was trying to make. And I would prefer the consequences be that you get better gas mileage instead of consequences like these. Our Gaia who art in rivers writes, it's so hard to talk about climate change or even listen to conversations about it. It feels like arguing with dogmatic Christians. Well, I do know that I sound like I'm preaching, but the reason is we're talking about a situation where there is science. There are people that have dedicated their entire lives, their entire careers to studying 
different parts of the climate. There are people that are digging in ice cores and studying the glaciers. There's people that study the hurricanes. There's people that study the, the oceans. There are people that are doing forestry and the fires. And all of them together are noticing how fast the climate is changing. And all of them together have done something miraculous in which they have figured out why. They know that this one product that was a miracle when we figured it out 100 years ago, it helped us build the society that we have. I am, I am grateful that the fossil fuel industry helped us get to where we're at, but is causing damage now. And these scientists have done their jobs. They told us this is what the problem is and this is how we can fix it. And yet the people that profit from this industry have spread so much bullshit that it is infecting conversations like these. Like we should be so fat, so far past the point where we're debating whether phasing out fossil fuels is necessary. And yet we're still here. And so what you're hearing is just frustration because we're not going to fix this problem. We're going to continue to have worse disasters, which are unpredictable. That's, that's the entire point. We can argue over, you know, the client, the, the scientists are doing their best. They're trying to tell us what they think might happen. But the whole point is that it's unpredictable. And that's why we can't prepare for these things. And that is what's so scary about it. And so when we have this denial of what the problem even is, how are we supposed to ever fix it? Speaking of phasing, actually China bad, right? There's a lot more nuance to the China-U.S. carbon output comparison. Yes, China has been making progress over the last two or three years. Yay. The nuance is they've seen a 20% increase over the last 15 years, and the U.S. has seen a 20% decrease in that same time period. China outputs twice as much carbon as the United States, and our trend line is pointing in the correct direction. Theirs is not. Will China be better 25 years from now? I sure fucking hope so, because currently they're not doing so hot, and I want to put that with this next email. Declining U.S. carbon use says the U.S. hit its carbon peak in 2007 and has been declining since. Notice the anomalous 2020 pandemic result. The idea that we are not doing anything about carbon emissions is intellectually dishonest. Um, there was actually two words that this person had in the email. The person said the idea that we're not doing anything slash enough about carbon emissions is intellectually dishonest. If I were to say that we're not doing anything about carbon emissions, yeah, that would be dishonest. It would also be really ridiculous for me to say because I am married to someone in the solar industry. So I didn't fucking say that. But the fact that we're not doing enough that's a fact. As long as we are still burning fossil fuels, as long as we are still, I mean, we're at the point that we are pumping more oil for the world to burn than we ever have in our history. We are not doing enough. And I don't think it's at all intellectually dishonest to say that, especially when you see this chart that Justin is probably going to show you, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, I can. Yeah. For the YouTube audience. Yeah, for the YouTube audience and for the people that aren't on YouTube, you can see that our usage from, I mean, it was basically nothing. We weren't burning anything in 1850. And then it goes up from there incrementally to a lot. It peaks around 2007, but we're, I mean, Andrew, how far down have we come from our peak? Uh, I don't know in terms of percentage. It looks to but me like, like it's ballpark. A, about the same as it was in like maybe 1990. That it's gone back down again. I mean, you know, compared to 1950, we're still much higher than that. We're maybe twice as high as 1950 eyeballing it. I don't have the, the, the stats in front of me. Yeah, but we're nowhere near zero. We're nowhere near zero. We keep contributing to the problem. And so, you know, you can say China bad all you want and whether it's true or not, fine. But we can only control what we do here and we are not doing enough. It's obvious. So you don't like that progress? It's not enough. Like, sure, I'm great. I'm happy with the progress. My family is contributing to it. We're doing what we can. But as long as we have an entire political party, one of the most powerful political parties in this country that continues to legislate to make it harder to get off of fossil fuels, we are in trouble. And that's the situation that we're in right now. I can't do this alone. Joe can't do this. Like, we, it has to be a societal thing. And right now, there's an enormously powerful force that is fighting against it. Uh, which party takes this seriously, writes, are Republicans not taking climate change seriously by not voting for the Inflation Reduction Act or are Democrats not taking it seriously by passing the Inflation Reduction Act and then using it to build seven or eight electric chargers? Seems like one party is spending a lot more tax dollars for the same result. OK, so now we're going to have a little lesson in clickbait, because the idea that they've only built seven to eight electric chargers is bullshit. So you're referring to a headline in a Washington Post article that you obviously did not read. 
because the Inflation Reduction Act, it had a lot of different ways to to put in electric car chargers. But there are also different kinds of electric car chargers. And so there was one program that was specifically for fast chargers. Only some electric cars can even use these fast chargers. I can't use these fast chargers, but that's specifically what they were talking about. But fast chargers are not as easy as normal chargers. Like my dad was able to put a a normal charger in his garage. But these fast chargers, each one of them usually has a, a couple physical like individual chargers on it for, you know, two to four cars. But each one of them requires as much energy as could power approximately 20 homes. And the way that this is done in the Inflation Reduction Act is the money goes from the feds into and then it goes to the states. And in order to get these grants, the states have to submit a plan that needs to be approved by the feds because there are requirements here. So like one of the requirements is that all of these chargers have to be within one mile of a highway because this particular program is about electrifying the highways so that, for instance, if when I have to drive from Texas to California next year, I would be able to reliably find chargers on my way. That's what they're trying to do with this one program. But it takes a while to get these chargers built because there's there's approvals. And then once the feds approve the state plans, then there's permits. And then getting the actual electricity lines, that takes a while. That that takes its own permits. And so they were actually installing these very close to my house and it took over a year to do. So the Inflation Reduction Act became law two years ago. I'm not surprised that the fast chargers have not popped up all over the place. But what you don't seem to know is that when Joe Biden took office, There were approximately 100,000 public chargers in the United States. Since the um, Inflation Reduction Act, they've doubled that. There's an extra 100,000 public chargers. Um, Or are they private? It's it's tough to say because the IRA did different methods of funding. So the IRA not only funded public chargers semi directly by giving money to the states, but it also created incentives for like apartment buildings and for individuals, if you want to put a charger somewhere. So some of them are private, but it could have roundabout been installed with federal money. We have, I don't have any way to track that. Yeah. But we do know there was a trend line that there were just, there was an increase in chargers in general that double, double. I mean, that's pretty good. The goal of the Biden administration at the time they packed the past the IRA was to have a half a million car chargers available to the public by 2030. So we're at 200,000. I'm not upset with that that pace. Would I like it to be charged or would I like it to be built out faster as an electric car driver? Like, of course I would. I would like to be able to drive a fully electric car. And right now I don't feel comfortable doing that because of my my range anxiety. But to say that there were only seven to eight chargers installed, I mean, that's simply not true. And the amount of time that it took me to find this information out was 10 seconds. So don't just read highlight or don't just read headlines like they're designed to get you to just click or just (sighs) do better dummy it's just not true yeah why does anyone pay attention to anything justin has to say right i know he's a contrarian devil's advocate and a sarcastic douchebag but why does he have to be this way every time jen has a truth you've behaved pretty well today so and plus it's his fucking job this would be boring if he wasn't needling us meanwhile heaton's in the shark cage (laughs) <laughs> just, just hanging out. Just <laughs> eating snakes hearts over just there. Hanging out. Just, you've been, you've been the fucking quiet boy award I'll, since. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll talk. But I kind of felt Jen was on a roll, no, and I, and I also is, felt like is, anything I said would, well, would be also, interpreted there as a whole lot of like, hey, let me fucking need, like, let me, let me go line yeah. by line on shit. No, that I'll, I'll, says. I'll, I'll, a lot I'll, of line by line on shit. I'll weigh in on yeah. some stuff, but I kind of want Jen. I feel like this is largely directed at Jen, so I want her to be able to say her piece. That way, it's not just heat and fighting Jen, which is not what I want to do. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, but is there anything you disagree with? I mean, I'm no, down well, to no, talk no. I, about I, it. What, what, what I'll do, I, I'm making a, a general statement. I want to be very, very clear. This is not a Jen statement. I am not talking about Jen. All right. <laughs> Everybody's got this. Jen, you've got this. <laughs> yes, I do. All right. So the, the, the two things that frustrate me when we get into climate change are this. Uh, on the conservative side, yes, climate change is happening. I think we should be worried about it. Um, I, I wish that conservatives would come to the table with more solutions to problems that we could talk about. That would be beneficial. Um, you, you don't have to go that far back to where this was happening. You really don't have to go that far back to where who was going to be the environmentalist party was up in the air. And I know that sounds batshit crazy now, but 
like Clean Air Act. That was what Nixon Clean or Clean Water Act's Nixon Clean Air Act is George W. EPA Bush. EPA was or, Nixon. Yeah, uh, EPA. Um, like if if even today, if you say conservation, like conservatives are like, well, I like conservation. It's just the word environmentalism has become politicized. So that bit bothers me. Uh, I would like conservatives to be a more part of that conversation because I think we could use the input because we all need to be working on this. The thing that I get frustrated with um, on the flip side of it is there is this, um, as, as one listener pointed out, there is this kind of religiosity that oftentimes gets baked into conversations about climate change that I don't think is helpful. Um, I, I am an environmentalist. And by that, I mean, I care about the environment and I actively personally do things to protect the environment. I donate money to things. Uh, I wish there were more environmentalists. I don't think there are very many environmentalists. I think that there's a lot of people that are kind of egoists for whom it's sort of a sub-religion. Uh, again, I'm not talking about Jim. I'm <laughs> yeah. talking about other interactions that I've had. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I really appreciate, Jen, you bringing up that like fossil fuels were really good at one point. They they really, really increased the standard of living for people across the globe. So reducing all energy sources into holy or evil, which is what I feel like a lot of the conversations I end up having are, I, I think those are not helpful conversations where, um, you know, anything anything that would appear in Fern Gully is good. Anything that <laughs> involves burning stuff is bad. I'm, I'm like, I, I really think we, slander. we need to look more at the effects and the trade-offs, which brings me to my final point. Whenever we're having a conversation about the environment, there really aren't solutions. There are trade-offs. Now, there, there are times where the trade-offs are so overwhelmingly good that we can just call it a solution. I'd say like acid rain legislation is a pretty good example of that, of uh, okay, some corporations lost a, a fractional amount of money and we don't have acid rain anymore. I think we all agree that that was pretty good legislation. For everything else, there's some kind of trade-off. We have to be talking about w- what is the trade-off here. And I, I, for me, I get frustrated because a lot of the conversations we get sucked into become this kind of proxy religious war between conservatives who do not think climate change is happening at all and egoists for whom uh, there are these sort of totemic identities surrounding energy. And I, I want to have... Um, actionable uh, trade-off conversations so we can move in a good direction. Agreed. And actually, I want to follow up on something I said last week um, now that you brought that up because I said that burning fossil fuels is bad. And I just want to say, like, I wasn't meaning it as like a moral judgment. It's more that in order to come together and have the goal of getting us off of fossil fuels and having cleaner energy. Like when you talk about the trade-offs, this one just feels like such a no brainer because you minimize the impacts of these, you know, the fires and the storms and all of that stuff, but also the toxins that comes from burning fossil fuels, just like the pollution alone is we don't have to do this anymore. We have the technologies where we don't have to do this anymore. So the trade-offs for me, it just seems so obvious, but the fact that we're still at the point that you have people that are defending the burning of fossil fuels and legislatively trying to keep us doing it. We need to get to the point where most of the rest of the world is already at, where we go, no, 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 this is an industry that actually for the good of all I don't humanity. That that's true. Most of the rest of the world is already at the, I mean, I think the, the vast majority of the world that is developing are more dependent on fossil fuels than yeah, they and that's have a, been. And yeah. that's a problem, but like they are aware that it's a problem. But, like I mean, there is an awareness aware that they would like to keep their hospital with lights. Exactly. Which is why investing in these technologies and saying that like being on fossil fuels is not good. We can lead by example. We can lead with technology. We can help the world with the, this. The, the, but burning fossil fuels is doing harm. That's what that's what I meant by that. I wasn't saying that's like it's not a question of good or evil. It's not, it's not a religious bad. It's thing. The effect that you're yeah. I, yes. I, I, and that's what I was trying to say. And I, I think that got muddled with the way that I put it last week. And I just wanted to make that clear. I'm not talking about good and evil. I'm talking about consequences. Here's, here's what I do think. Uh, and, and I don't blame you for this because you are somebody that has been on the front lines of this conversation for a very long time. And I would not want somebody who is on the front lines of a war to negotiate the armistice that might end it because there is a lot of emotions and you have spent a lot of time here having these conversations and being frustrated by it. But I do think that at times you can reject incrementalism for the sake of a larger goal. And so when you look at like that, we have meaningfully reduced that we've turned a corner on fossil fuel usage. Yes, you can say there's a long way to go, but I think dismissing what has been done is to give away a wedge point and leverage 
that can very much be used to your aim. And, and, and but I don't think I'm dis- like, I disagree with the premise. I don't think I'm dismissing what has been done. I will say that based on the volume of emails that we got, if, if you are aiming to embrace the fact that the United States has turned a corner and that we are doing better and we need to do even better than that, that has not come through. What has come through is that fossil fuels are bad and anybody who uses them is being a part of a greater evil. I'm not going to pretend that a 10% decrease in our fossil fuel usage, we're done. Like no we're at the Again, that's not what I'm saying. But the Republicans are. Okay. That's but that's fine. that was my uh, okay. entire point with what I said and I think that if people are writing in and saying that I'm dismissing my own husband's career, they're wrong. They're wrong. Like I I love the fact that I get my energy from Austin Energy. Every time I plug in my car, I know it is being powered by wind. I think that is great. That was not the case probably 10 years ago. We have made improvements, but we are still the number two biggest emitter in the world and we can do better. I expect us to do better. That's what I'm saying. Yes. I'm saying that you should acknowledge also that we have done better. I, I'd like to pose an incremental question. So yeah. the the best case scenario, Jen, for you would be that we we have a completely renewable grid. We have a, a smart grid paired with entirely renewable sources, wind power, I mean, uh, solar power, hydropower, all of that. Um, a, assuming that it is not legislatively possible, because I, I don't know the technique. What I have read is that, that we're, we're not anywhere near there, but you, you've no. read stuff to the contrary. So putting a, a pin- Oh, no, you're correct. We're nowhere near it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Put, putting a pin on the technical side of it, legislatively, if the the realistic options were we keep going with fossil fuel as it is, or we reduce that by increasing reliance on nuclear power, would you, would you take the deal on the latter? Because that's very much where I am. I, it seems to me that nuclear power, being concerned about climate change, nuclear power seems to me to be a very meaningful, immediate way we can really reduce carbon. I'm not in favor of nuclear power until you can figure out what to do with the waste and until the dangers of making places uninhabitable are gone. I just, it's not, it's not the way I would prefer that we go here when we have cleaner, safer technologies available. So it's, if we're going to invest in something, I would, I would prefer we choose the best method. Um, When I think about incrementalism, I think about what are the actual proposals happening right now, which is, you know, not forcing every fossil fuel vehicle off the off of the planet, but instead making every one of those more fuel efficient. Like that's that's the kind of incrementalism that is actually being done in Congress that is being. Isn't that what caused the big trucks? No. Fuel efficiency laws? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, like they the, what, what happened during the Obama administration was there were fuel efficiency standards that were based on your efficiency relative to the size of the car. Yeah. Um, so if you had a bigger car, it was more it was more fuel efficient in terms of ratio. And so if you got a bigger truck, you ended up hitting those. Um, the, the the way around that to me is I think you're adding unnecessary steps when you do that kind of legislation. I don't I don't like top down EPA type stuff. What I want to do is incentivize the market from the bottom up, which is why I want to have a carbon tax. Like if you want to have a big car, just pay more for the gas. Yeah. Like so. Um, like I like to me that that's the thing where um. Uh, like I, I do want there to be uh, government action here because I think that we are not actually paying the real price of carbon. But once you factor that in, I don't really care how people go with it. If you want to pay extra in order to have a car with a lot of gas, that's fine um, because you're you're now going to have to think about it. Alternately, the market would shrink cars if they yeah. if, if they. If it but it was gas efficiency fo- regulations yes. that, that brought about that the gargantuan trucks that it's an example that were yeah. that were done poorly. This is what is done via which is done. What is done via wow. legislation can be changed via legislation as long as there are good faith actors that are trying to solve these problems. Right now, the Republican Party is not a good faith faith actor trying to solve these problems because ideas like Andrews with the carbon tax or you know tweaking the fuel efficiency laws or whatever, like these are not on the table because they are fighting against it completely. I, I, I just don't think that. So when you no, hold on a second, because I was accused of not being in favor of incrementalism. I am absolutely down with incrementalism. What I'm not down with is slamming the brakes on all progress, which is what that party is doing on this, this issue. Now you may speak. <laughs> I don't believe that legislation is going to get us where we want to go. And if we think that this is a existential crisis, then you just need to continue to uh, get the technology better to the point where it's cheaper for people. People are hooked on fossil fuels, not because they have some 
desire to burn fossil fuels. They burn fossil fuels because it's very portable and it's very cheap relative yeah. to other technologies. The We have made progress because we have created other technologies that deliver cheaper energy. The more you do that, the better that things are. Part of the promise of renewables, part of the, part of the promise of solar and wind and stuff like that is that it can supplement, if not replace, a lot of these things on a large uh, uh, scale level. The more you do that and the better you do it, the better t battery technology gets, which I do think that sometimes you do overstate how much this is a plug and play solution because we can underpants gnome like, yeah, 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 lithium batteries are going to be outdated and we're going to have a different technology, but we don't have that at the kind of scale that we need right now. Uh, and it also does come with other trade-offs in terms of mining and creating some places that are uninhabitable. And so if we're uh, creating a situation where we're worried about putting nu nuclear waste certain places. Well, then we also have to realize that if we want to build the kind of batteries that we are going to need with the kind of materials that we need for them, we're going to have to create these massive mines. And those are often controversial as well. You can look yeah. at like n local Nevada politics. And everything you just said is completely fair. And, and I actually know that there's quite a few problems with electric vehicles. The batteries are heavier. They actually make these cars more dangerous on the roads. Like there's there's problems to be had. There's pro There's problems. I get that. But what I'm saying is the conversation we are having right now with like, OK, what's the best way forward is not the conversation happening in Congress because one party is not participating. I, I think, I think in you've it. made that clear. Yes. Well, that is my main point. I, so I got, I got another thing to rag on. This has not come up. This is not a gen thing. This isn't really even an American thing. But when I'm over in Britain and I'm over in Europe, one of the things that I end up getting sucked into weird arguments about are I'll have friends go, um, we just have to use less energy, not in the efficiency sense, as Jen has previously brought up, but in the sense of like, we have to tighten the belt. We're being too affluent as a civilization, mm. and we just need to reduce the energy consumption by half. And I'm like, that's insane. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen, um, which is one of the reasons I'm big on nuclear is I, I think we just have to take as a given that when civilizations uh, industrialize, the the energy output doesn't decline. Um, so you that, just have to that, come up that with to me is religious. The uh, the concept yes. of no, no we, we my, need to my, sacrifice. The, the, my, the friend Gaia that I'm thinking of that not frown. lives in Edinburgh. I'm like, it's like I'm talking to uh, a. What were, what were those dudes during the plague that would strike their back with whips? Not not for later. <laughs> That's not the word I'm looking for. Um, I know what you're talking. You know, flagellator, flagellate, yeah. flagellant, yeah. self-flagellation. But he, but he, like he, he, he did that. He's like, um, we just, we have to be, uh, we're just going to have to be poor for a while. And like that to him was the self-evident mm -hmm. explanation. Is we just, the, the rest of the world gets to be affluent. We're going to be poor. And I'm like, why don't you just have nuclear power and everybody gets rich? And and he was like, well, you can't do that. No, because it's an icky power. And I was yeah. like, what? And, yeah, hair well, suit. And one thing I do want to bring up that I'm pissed at myself for not bringing up um, earlier is that there's actually two kinds of nuclear power. So when I talk about the dangers of nuclear power, I'm talking about one specific kind, the kind that we have right now. There have been breakthroughs in the other kind that doesn't have any of the nuclear waste issues. Um, I believe I always get them because the words are very similar. So fission and fusion, I believe we have fission and fusion is the one that they're working on. But I love listening to those hearings because there have been amazing breakthroughs. And if fusion becomes a possibility, then this problem is solved. So it's like, I would love to invest all of the money right now that they are putting towards the old technology. I would like to zero that out and go all in well, on the other kind because the world is kind of moving away from the old one. If we could figure out this new one, like that's such a game changer that that would be exciting to me. So it's like, would I be willing to participate in that when it comes to nuclear? Absolutely. But it's the old technology with all of its dangers that I'm just. I, I, I believe, and I'll have to check this, but Sam Altman of OpenAI, number one, AI is going to be incredibly energy resource. Uh, yeah. uh, Google dependent. just purchased a nuclear reactor so today. Amazon. Microsoft yeah. just purchased Three Mile Island. And like they're all doubling down on nuclear in order to, because there's going to be a massive input of energy necessary. And Sam Insane. Altman, Sam Altman of OpenAI, his big bet is on Oklahoma. Uh, uh, that kind of technology. Yeah. And his, as it bet, should be. his bet is that like AI will allow us to get us to the point where we can solve some of these issues that have remained a bottleneck on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, like uh, um, the, the fusion you're talking about, Jen, as I understand, it, I don't follow the super close. There have been really interesting breakthroughs that have taken place in the last four years. So one took place two years ago in 2022. And um, I don't speak physics, but my, my, my understanding <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, is that we were dangerously getting out they, of our they, fucking wheelhouse ha here. Having spoken to multiple scientists about this, where I was like, hi, I don't know what this is. Is this bullshit? And they're like, no, there was a, a theoretical barrier that was broken that displayed that it's feasible. 
Yeah, there was a demonstration project yeah. and it worked. The only, the, the concern that I have is this, um, fusion would be great, right? Fusion power would be really, really good. We might get there. Um, I am wary of putting our eggs in that basket because we've been 10 years away from fusion every year for the last 50 years. So there's always been that. So I like, like we're, we're at the, the reason that I'm very big on nuclear power is, um, I, I don't want to hold out for a, maybe it will come solution. I want to make sure that we can use solutions that are currently available. If, if you find the, the data or the report on how we, we could have an entirely green energy grid, um, without needing to rely on massive battery power. I sent that to you on Twitter already. I sent it. Like right after we talked. Oh, thanks. So yeah, I, check your Twitter. I, I will check that. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to fusion, I thought the same thing. And then I watched a hearing with the the people after that demonstration project worked and they are much more bullish on the, the time range. Cause like if we were going to build more fission, cause like the main problem with fission is once you turn it on, you can't turn it off, which is why those rods have to be stored for decades. Fusion, you can turn it off. And so that's like the main benefit. And as far as I see it. But they were saying that now that they've demonstrated that the technology can work, that unsure timeline is no longer as unsure. It was really I, I should have I I'll watch the next hearing and then do an Please episode do. on it. But it was that I would be down with. Sure. And and uh, I hope I hope we get there. And I'm I'm very optimistic, as I said last program. Um, I think part of the problem we are facing also contains the solution and that the whole arc the IPCC has of increased carbon is contingent on the third world and the second world developing. And that's great because all these smart people that are currently shoveling literal shit and inhaling um, a burning cow dung into their lungs are going to be the next Einstein and the next Steve Jobs. That's really, really good. So I'm, I'm very optimistic on this. I, I hope fusion comes around. That'll be great. Uh, in, in the meantime, um, I, I want whatever the, the, practical, the practical technology is that we currently have. I want to be deploying it there. Same. The best emailer writes, I'm lying in bed <laughs> listening to the political commentary discuss who deserves the most powerful office in the land. Should we go with the last minute replacement for a corpse or the former game show host that already abused the position previously? Quote, wait, Puff Daddy is Diddy? Wait, what even is a demure nude? Jerry, help me with the slang. Didn't an emailer call Trump a no cap Rizzler? What's Kamala? Kamala would be brat, same as Hak Tua. I don't think that a few ways that a nude could be demure. Trump might be a Rizzler, but in a cringe way. Lil Yachty would probably be described by the youth as base. And I bolt awake. Quickly, I dress and look outside of my tent to the rest of the encampment. Hannibal, my lieutenant addresses me. You're up early. You look like you've seen a ghost. Ignoring him, I peer across the mountains of Carthage. I'm not online, listening to podcasts. Such things don't exist. Never have. The vision, the absurd language, the orange politicians. Surely that can't be the future. A future that can't be allowed to come to pass. In my heart, I now speak the truest words that have ever crossed the lips of man. Rome must burn. <laughs> this is a phenomenal email. Yeah. This th started out funny and then had a short story built into it. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> We're Not Wrong is a production of Dog and Pony Show Audio. Our editor is old Willie Saddleberg on this week's edition of PX3. Holy crap. We got a great, great, great roster of guests. Carl Markowitz, or Carol Markowitz of the New York Post and Fox News talks to us about the Jewish vote. We have J.D. Durkin live from the New York Stock Exchange trading floor. Oh, JD. To talk, I love J.D. Durkin. To talk about uh, friend of mine. the economy. And then on Friday's edition of the program, we're going to do our narrative draft, going through all the stories that might be the number one thing people talk about this election, guessing what they're going to be now. We have Carl Allen to talk about the why we are all reading polls wrong and uh, uh, how we need to look at them going forward. And hopefully... The moderator of the Ted Cruz Colin Allred debate will be on the show oh, nice. as well. Hopefully that comes to pass. If not, wow. then uh, sorry. But it is a star spangled week, Justin. But, you know, we're, we're, we're ramping up here for for the election. Uh, politics, politics, politics dot com now actually leads to our sub stack. There was a problem with the domain. But uh, also, if you have not changed. Over it was good porn, though. When I clicked it, <laughs> it what it took me to, I, it really opened some doors. No, it'll gird your loins. Don't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're girded. I really hope this doesn't become a thing. <laughs> I want to think about girding? loins. Like, ugh. 
Loins and moist, they're all in the same category. I feel like gird your loins is actually a fairly, but that just means like you're putting armor around yourself. All right. right. There's kids listening. It's the loins reference. I icked out the first time you said it in all seven times you said it. Is this not a fairly common phrase, gird your loins? No. Jen, what's what's going on on the dish? (laughs) So one of the reasons I'm so damn tired is that I read two very long bills. One of them was H.R. 2, which is the Republicans wet dream for immigration policy. They passed that basically first thing in this Congress. And then I also read the bipartisan Senate legislation in order to give you the details. Which version? What do you mean, which version? Well, there was the one that was tacked onto the Ukraine stuff. And then there was the one that they tried to pass. That's the one that was it. filibustered. OK, so yeah, that was the it was one a standalone. The one, the one, OK, it was. So that was the one that Kirsten Cinema and. Uh, and Lankford negotiated. No, they didn't vote for that one. They did not vote for it, but they negotiated it. That was when it was stapled onto the Ukraine bill. But uh, apparently regardless, it was, changed. it was changed from that, from the first one. Well, I read one of them. It was the <laughs> one that was filibustered. But basically Kamala said that she's going to sign that once she becomes president. That's her promise. HR2 is the Republicans promise. And we've heard so much about border, border, border and immigration, but I have absolutely no idea what the details of their plans are. And now I do. Mm. And and so that's what the episode is. It's a, a comparison of the two. And I learned about what our current immigration policies are. So if you really give a shit about this topic, this will give you more details. The, than our I think our you've current heard immigration else. policies are like really straightforward, simple and kind of common sense, right? <laughs> Not really. Like they're, they're, they're really like they're, <laughs> as I recall, it's one page front and back. Yeah, and uh, it's it's kind of based on the needs of the American people combined with our values of being an open country. No, and even just summarizing it was really hard to do. So it's definitely like an overview situation. Like I had to kind of look at what we're doing now in order to see how the two plans would change the situation. So, but it was very interesting to see the the different priorities and just knowing from my own research going back through all of Congressional Dish, like they've identified problems that we're having. And it was interesting for me to go like, okay, which version actually would solve these issues? And and yeah, so that's, I will have that out soon. (laughs) It should be before the next episode, which is why I'm talking about it today. Heaton. Back by popular demand, I am doing third party week on the political orphanage. I did this in 2020. I interviewed the a Libertarian Party candidate, Green Party candidate, Constitution Party candidate, and I spoke to folks from the Alliance Party, which is defunct as far as I can tell. So this week, uh, I am I'm speaking to Chase Oliver, Cornell West, and we will do an episode on the Green Party, although I don't know if Jill Stein personally will be on it or not. So if you want to familiarize yourself with the minor parties that are on the ballots in the United States, check out the Political Orphanage. Look at that. <laughs> That'll wrap it up for us today. For Andrew Heaton and Jen Briney, I'm Justin Robert Young, reminding you that we're not wrong. You are. That is not going to be our tagline. <laughs> yes, it is. No, it's, it's so rude. <laughs>